Hello, and welcome to the Voice of Reason podcast. I'm your host, Benjamin Boyce, and today's guest is Timothy Courtois, who is a licensed professional counselor, which I don't know exactly what that means, but we do talk about counseling and his attitude towards assisting people to figure out the ailments that ail them or the problems that ail them. We also talk about a uh, adventure that he had when he sought a certification in sexual health and sexual counseling. He wrote an article in Quillette about that, and we get into that particular adventure of his. And we also talk about just the human condition and trying to pursue a healthy mental life and constellating your values, your emotions, and your thoughts in a nice package that can adapt to the slings and arrows of these difficult times. One of my favorite things to do is to interview psychologists because they are studied conversationalists, if nothing else. And they also think a lot about things that are really important to me, such as meaning and life and being a good person and feeling good while doing so. So without further ado, here is Timothy Courtois. The problem I have with you licensed professional counselors is that I don't know what the honorific is. How do I... <laughs> we don't know either. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's different in every state and every profession. It's like... Oh, really? But... Uh, you guys aren't doctor. I can't say, hey, doctor. Or... You can call me doctor if you want to. I am not a doctor. <laughs> okay. Well, see, that's the thing. Then, then you get in trouble, I get in trouble. Yeah, right, right. Well, it's not a particularly honorable profession these days, so maybe we shouldn't have an honorific anyway. Oh, interesting. That's that's a shot across the bows. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it is, isn't it? Well, that's that's where we're at. It's been a weird time. Well, Sasha's been working her uh, herself uh, to the max, uh, doing yeah. great work uh, in a in a particular domain. She works with teens. Mm -hmm. You work with. Couples, is that correct? Or families? No, 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 not couples. Um, I'm kind of all over the map, really. Um, I mean, I used to, for a lot of years, I worked for a church that was on a college campus. Um, and so I was working pretty much exclusively with college age or like immediately post college age kids. Kids, you know. Yeah. But uh, uh, now it's kind of all over the map. I do work with a number of teenagers. Um, kids who are who are com who have come out as trans, um, okay. but that it really issues all across the map. It's sort of I'm, I'm not super discriminating when people get in touch with me. Um, I'm just open to a wide variety of issues because hmm. kind of everything's human. So um, is that that seems like the key term because I, I wanted to kind of frame everything. Like, what does a counselor do, and how did you get into that? How did you? Uh, find your way there yeah yeah so um the way well the way so i had a i have a weird path because uh, you know i like i said i was involved in a church for many years and so the i got involved in a college focused church when i was when i was an undergrad student and then i went on staff for that church after i graduated and then after a number of years it was sort of like my involvement in that church ministry, I just found that the the component of it that I really was best at and enjoyed the most was, you know, listening to and caring for people who were struggling. And, and there was a real need for that. Uh, and so after a number of years on staff, I decided I wanted to go pursue some training. So then I, I sought out you know, I, I went to grad school, became a counselor, and then I went back to work for that church for a few years. Um, and then a lot of things in my life and in the world kind of fell apart uh, a number of years ago. And, and, and I ultimately decided to leave that role and, and branch out a little bit and start my own private practice. Okay. Is your, is your life uh, the reason why the world's falling apart? Is this, it's can we blame it on you? I would be glad to take the blame. Uh, yeah, you can. <laughs> in good Christian fashion. <laughs> right, right, right. Do we need a fall guy? I, I'd be glad to. Should I just proclaim myself the savior? Is is uh, I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I, I'm actually pretty certain that's a terrible thing. So. Um, I know a lot of people in a adjacent profession to you that deal with people who uh, take on the burden of the world's uh, sins and. Uh, What's that? Well, uh, you know uh, the. 
stereotypical crazy person who thinks they're Jesus or Satan, you know, so yeah, it seems like well, a very difficult path to take. <laughs> yeah, to be Jesus or Satan. Yeah, yeah, to take on that uh, that role. Yeah, I mean, it's weird because it's it's a thing that there, there's some things about this the social justice world that that are a weird mirror to the Christian world. Um, yeah. You know, in you know, in terms of the moralizing and the the cancel culture, which in some ways Christians kind of pioneered in the 80s and 90s and 2000s. Well, in and, the 1500s. Sure, too. sure. Let's go there too. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> let's broaden the time scope a little bit. Yeah. Um, but then, like, sort of the 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 trying to be hyper responsible for what everybody else is doing or needs to do or needs to know and, 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 and becoming a little bit controlling and even codependent in that regard. I mean, that's kind of mainstream now is it's your job mm. to take responsibility for everything else that's happening in the world. Um, mm -hmm. what, so, what is, could you define codependency? Uh, yeah, that's, that's a great question. I mean, it, the, the word gets used in a lot of different ways. Yeah. Um, so especially colloquially, um, the the way I tend to think about it is it originated from Alcoholics Anonymous. And the idea was, you know, when uh, when AA started, they implemented these principles and they saw these alcoholics who were dependent on alcohol um, getting better. And what they thought was, oh, wow, when they're getting better, then their marriages are going to get better. Their families are going to get better. And what they found was, no, a lot of times things went downhill. They got worse. And what they realized was, yeah, the alcoholic was dependent on alcohol, but their spouse was codependent with them. Oh. So the spouse had uh, arranged their life and their sense of being so much around rescuing or taking care of their 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 spouse who was who was an addict, you know, con you know, sort of living to mitigate the effects of their their addiction. That when that addiction was gone, they no longer had uh, that sense of th that sort of anchor to ground themselves in. Their whole sense of identity was thrown off. The and ailment th becomes a major part of the relationship, or, or almost yeah. like a child or a third third part. Or yeah, component. I mean, it's kind of in some ways, it's like it's like a a parent who is too involved with their child, and then the child grows up and doesn't need them to be so involved anymore, and then everything goes haywire because. The parent doesn't know how to define themselves apart from, I am the one who sort of controls this little being, who is now not a little being anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen that uh, behavior, or I've kind of noticed that, and I'm, I don't want to be hesitant about uh, diagnosing anybody, but in my studies of uh, campus uh, social justice uh, culture mm -hmm. gone awry, what you see, what I've seen is that there are these usually it's usually a group of women who don't have children who are infantilizing the students and then there's yeah. this temper tantrum that that is initiated through the language and the ritualization of a social justice uh, uh, revolution or something but there's this codependency between the teachers who are trying to rescue the students and the students who are trying to rescue themselves from the system it, mm -hmm. it's this really weird kind of uh, almost like a maladaptive mother Hood kind of yeah thing. enmeshment, you enmeshment. Know, people, people kind of become merged with one another yeah yeah um, and yeah. and don't have the ability to sort of um, have a clear sense of where do I end and where does this other person begin where do my responsibilities end and where does the responsibility of this other person begin yeah, yeah I don't want to um, I don't want to oversimplify that and and codependency isn't even a diagnosis um, it's not in the DSM, uh, as far as I'm aware. Um, but, but it's like, in all things, there's usually a spectrum. Like, nobody believes we should just say, you know, screw everybody else. I'm going to be responsible for me and not care about anybody else. And hopefully nobody believes, I mean, I, sh I shouldn't say nobody. Some people believe that stuff. But then very few people are going to be at the extreme opposite end of the spectrum where they say, I must take full responsibility for everybody else. But we can lean one side or the other and mm. different situations probably call for different emphases. Um, yeah. I think you see this playing out really in the dichotomy of the right and left in our world where the right's going to more emphasize personal responsibility and the left is going to more emphasize communal responsibility. And yeah. You see it with COVID where, um, you know, I, I mean, I see these posts on social media a lot where 
people on the left who, in some cases, I might have indication that they they are kind of codependent in their own personal lives, but then they'll sort of make these posts that say, you know, they're angry that other people aren't taking enough responsibility for the whole world. And so now I have to bear even more responsibility for the whole world and mm. lock down even more and mask up even more. I'm not getting all, you know, anti-masks or, or, yes, or, yes. or anything. I'm, I'm, but, but I think people fall into these extremes at times. Yeah. So. Yeah. There's uh, there's a lot of interesting phenomena that occur on social media and it, I like how you bring up there, there is a spectrum between total bootstrapping meritocracy and total uh, co just complete collectivist thinking, complete uh, yeah. communalism or communism of, of that type. But when we critique social justice ideology, just for example, the way that we critique it is by looking at these patterns of behavior that are emerging and then trying to see, well, how is this unhealthy? How, how do these ideas or these tenets lead to this unhealthy behavior? And I guess, do you have, is, is healthiness or health an operative framework for you mm -hmm. in, in your work? Or terms Gosh, like, I guess, balance, question. or like, how do you, what, what's the, what's the good goal or the good state? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I wish I knew. Um, it's funny, because like, we could really have two separate, really difficult conversations, because one would be, what do I think personally? And the other is like, how do I operate as yes. a therapist? Um, yeah. I, uh, um, and then how do you separate those two? Or how do they work in conjunction? Are they codependent? Well, Right. <laughs> yeah, how do you separate those two? I mean, it, it's hard. I, I mean, I think the the beginning of any of those conversations has to be, gosh, it's complex, and all of it's yeah. going to fall somewhere along a spectrum, and no answer is going to be absolute, especially my articulation of it on a random day when I happened to be up for two or three hours in the middle of the night last night with my one-year-old and oh congratulations and <laughs> yeah yeah and well now today uh, with you i'm overcompensating with caffeine so <laughs> we'll see how that goes well and plus everything that's happening in the world and probably the patients that you had last week and the books you've been reading and and the stuff that you're just trying to process through and practice and uh yeah it's a lot um but i think i lean towards like I mean, in, in my work anyway, I really emphasize, like, my work as a therapist is not about me. It's not about what I believe or what I think. It's about, like, if you are my client, okay, you've come here to me. You have something that's going on that apparently you're troubled by. So what is it that you're looking for? What is it that you're hoping to overcome? And then we'll talk about that. And mm -hmm. in the process, uh, you know, it, it's certainly my role to be active in terms of like if i see something that seems troubling or or like it might need to be drawn out a little bit more i might ask about that or challenge something but ultimately i'm letting my clients hmm. i'm trying to operate with a very light hand to invite them to discover and think out what they want to do about whatever's going on in their life and, and hmm. so that really emphasizes personal responsibility yeah. significantly yeah, yeah. And why is personal responsibility a good thing? Just to break it down to basics. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, again, the, so as a therapist, I might say, um, I, I'm not going to tell you that you have to prioritize personal responsibility, but I'm not going to take responsibility for you because I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm busy screwing up my own life uh, oh, okay. I don't, I don't huh. take responsibility for for everything in your life those are things that uh, the way things are constructed apparently you have to make those decisions okay yeah. uh, you know personally uh, I, I I do think while, while I think there is a, a tension between the individual and the communal um, it does seem like the the sort of the the core thing the core unit of what really matters in the world is people uh individuals who have who have consciousness and and some 
power of of choice you know whether you believe ultimately in free will or not doesn't really matter but still you're you're on some level choosing and Mm -hmm. um so that just seems to be sort of the fact of things i'm I'm, and in that regard i'm i'm certainly influenced by my own christian background though i I don't know really where i stand with that belief system at at this point in my life that's a whole story we can certainly get into but what your job is is a pretty ancient role too a minister a pastor (laughs) accepting or excerpting it or distinguishing it from any sort of religious uh, framework, but you are a counselor as somebody, a role in society that has persisted and been developed for mm-hmm. for ages. Uh, mm-hmm. In a secular world, you don't have a text uh, or a bunch of theology and a Bible to work on. What What is this mass of uh, ideas and uh, this framework that you draw from and... Uh, I guess it's always emerging. You wrote a piece in Quillette where you tried yeah. to learn about sexuality, and you were immersed in a completely different framework that uh, it, it seems like you didn't think was necessarily a good framework. But no, it was awful. <laughs> the, cur- it, the incursion of social justice or some sort of conflict theory into sexuality or some sort of yeah. complete radical. Yeah, could you tell Should, the story of yeah, your me, journey into sexual studies? That. And it, it relates to. <laughs> my own story a little bit. So maybe I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that and piggyback into how I got into that program. Um, so I had been in the church for a long time and, um, I wouldn't say I was like a Christian counselor in the sense of like, you know, I'd never considered it my role to sort of just quote the Bible at people and say, well, this is what you have to do because this verse says it. So that's the answer to your question. Yeah. I was never that at all. Um, I, I always considered it my role to be a place, like a, a primarily a listening ear, um, a place where people could sort of wrestle through whatever they're needing to wrestle through. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, not to distract you, but you've brought up listening. I, I th- think that's very key. How did you stumble upon that as your role, as, as a listener? Um, how did you know to do that, or how did you get drawn to doing that? That's a great question. I mean, that, to some degree, personality. Like I've, I've always been naturally very curious. And I mean, gosh, like one of the things my dad always says about me when I was little is like, I would sort of in a new situation, I'd sort of sit back and watch for a long time and just sort of hold back until I kind of figured things out. And then I'd be able to enter into it. And that's, definitely true of me in some good ways and even to a fault. So my, I think my default has always been, uh, give me the information, help me understand. I want I want to, I want to hear more until I really un- think I know what's going on here. And with regard to the world, um, there's just too, too damn much to ever really feel like you ever know what the hell's going on. So I could sit back and study forever. You know, if you're familiar with like the Enneagram, like I've been typed as a five, which is like, the type that just wants to collect all the information until you've got it all figured out. And and I don't don't hold to that really firmly, but um, I think that's indicative of my personality type. Um, uh, Yeah. So I think that just always kind of made sense to me. And then I think when I started getting involved in in therapy, I mean, I think I I really was grateful for the training that I got. Um, It's funny. I mean, I went to the university of Michigan as an undergrad and hated my experience there um that's a whole long story but but the it's ironic that the the education i got from a seminary as a as a christian who was becoming a therapist at a christian school was actually really um beautifully open and and not dogmatic um but really challenged us and invited us to critical thought and and didn't want us to just be indoctrinators uh, you know of our clients uh so it was a really fantastic program i loved it um that was reformed theological seminary in orlando florida um yeah where was i going (laughs) <laughs> uh, we were ta- I, I distracted you from uh, your oh, yeah. practice in, in, within church. the context of the church, yeah. Yeah, so um, right around 2016, 
a lot of things just fell apart. Like the, my church had been embroiled in um, kind of a really awful scandal for several years at that point, and just it was just a, a whole gross and really disillusioning situation that uncovered a lot of the unhealth in our midst, it, it, culturally and in our relationships that um, had been there for a long time, but just became more and more clear. And that was a really extremely disillusioning time. And, and in the midst of that, um, just a lot of other things happened in my personal life. Like our first child was born that year, and that, for a number of reasons, was really hard. I had some chronic health issues that were, I was in severe pain all year, couldn't sleep. And so then I became severely depressed. And just lots of things wow. really were okay. changing in my life that year. And um, sort of in the midst of that, my my sense of groundedness and certainty in my faith really kind of disintegrated and I was really in a kind of lost place. So I, um, long story short, I eventually just decided, okay, it's time for me to sort of get some distance from this church that I've been in, though uh, there were a lot of beautiful things there and I'm still good friends with a number of people there. It didn't feel like a fit for me anymore. And I just, I needed distance for, you know, I, I mean, I couldn't even go there, uh, cause I would, I would just find my whole body and mind shutting down, just walking into the building. So I, yeah. I needed the distance. Um, so all that to say when I started, you know, then I was starting my private practice and I was realizing, gosh, my whole career, I've sort of been in this Christian ghetto, you know, we, you know, Christians kind of do that, you know, they kind of say, okay, we're going to listen to the Christians, we're going to listen to the Christian thinkers and read the Christian writers, and everybody yes. else is untrustworthy. And I never really loved that. Mm. But I, you know, I had kind of fallen into that professionally speaking. And so I was like, gosh, I'd love to be more of a part of the broader conversation in my profession. And I wonder if there's a good way to do that. And I had always, a lot of my work had been centered around sexuality. I'd done a lot of work with um, people who had experienced sexual abuse or various kinds of sexual harm in their story. That was most of my work. Um, so I started looking stuff up and I, I found out about this program at the University of Michigan called the Sexual Health Certificate Program. And it's a year-long program, gives um, uh, the participants all the requirements they need to be certified by ASECT, which is A-A-S-E-C-T, that's the American Association of Sexuality Educators, Counselors, and Therapists. <laughs> Money like that. <laughs> I just love acronyms, and, and sometimes yeah. they get really, really goofy. <laughs> it's really, uh, it's long. But I, it's funny, because I was like, that's exactly what I'm interested in. Like, it's sexuality, it's therapy, it's teaching. I was interested in that. Um, sexuality education. I, I just thought, I really care about the broader cultural conversation that we could have about sexuality and what it is. It's this really hmm. core component of human life where we get a sense of meaning and beauty. Um, and yet it's like kind of endlessly mysterious, um, hard to really put your finger on. And so I just thought, man, I'm really interested in this. And I thought I found this little niche, this group of therapists who are really passionate about this. This would be the perfect place for me. Um, and especially since I kind of pulled back from what had been my tribe for a long time I, and was looking to get connected to my profession in a broader way, I thought this would be perfect. So that was um, the, the cohort I signed up for was the 2019-2020 cohort. So I basically oh. began mid-2019 and finished the program mid-2020. Um, and uh, This is got, where things get weird. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, really, <laughs> especially because of my experience in the church. And, you know, so I had kind of, uh, you know, developed, a, a, let's say, an allergic reaction internally to things that could feel cult-like because of some of the crappiness I had seen in, in the church I had been in previously. So when I got into the program and just everything felt so familiar— I mean, it, it was weird because it was all sort of framed in this um, superioristic, you know, we're better than everybody else. We're especially better than okay. anybody who's conservative or religious. Um, I mean, throughout the program, anybody who had any religious background, if they ever even mentioned it, they would feel 
sort of obligated to apologize up front for all of the mm-hmm. atrocities of their own belief system and for being a part of, you know, the yeah. whole... You, you have to perform this renunciation. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was very um, common throughout the program. And I, I have to assume or question there's probably a hierarchy, either hidden or um, uh, either implicit or explicit, like uh, some sort of very strong uh, hierarchy of some sort, and who Hi- was allowed... Uh, just a power structure that's pretty tight. If you're talking about a cult-like experience, I'm just questioning, was there like a power structure that was either explicit or implicit that you had to Um, adhere to? There's, there's, I'd say, a kind of an abstract structure in the sense of like... Identity-based. Yeah, the woke Olympics sort of thing. Like whoever has the most... um, the most oppression points, you know, sort yeah. of sits at the top of the hierarchy. And if, if you're a, obviously, if you're a white man, you 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 better apologize and yeah. um, speak very deferentially in anything that you say. And yeah. I mean, and that was just common. You know, people sort of uh, before saying something, you'd have to give like fifty disclaimers about like, I'm sorry, I don't already know the answer to this question because I should really understand this about this marginalized people group. But can you help me understand more about da 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 da? You know, you'd have to go through this kind of ritual. Mm-hmm. Um, but then, I think, in terms of like noticing a, a sort of cult-like or religious element to the program, it, it was just there was this very clear belief system that never could be challenged, or and oftentimes wasn't even very clearly articulated, but it was implicit. And and everybody seemed to sort of either already know it or or sort of pick up on it and play along throughout the program. Hmm. Um, Did you? Yeah. I, I experienced something similar, uh, huh. not as intense as what you're saying, but I was at a college that kind of became that over oh, yes, over yes. the course of my time. Yes. And what I ended up doing was just uh, silencing myself. I I wouldn't play along, but I knew I couldn't go against it. So I just kind of uh, became more and more restricted in, in what I could or what I allowed myself to express. Uh, yeah. how, did, how did you deal with that or did you cede to it and give it ground, say, okay, I'll play along? And Yeah, I mean, I did a bit of everything, I think, but yeah. certainly a lot of that. I mean, I found myself very early on getting a sense that like kind of, whoa, like this, <laughs> I'm not... I better tread softly here because I don't know how much of my real thoughts I'm allowed to show, um, especially because I'm at the beginning of a program and, you know, I'm thinking about my career and my, you know, whether my reputation is going to be harmed or whether I'm going to get kicked out or alienate or burn some bridges that I don't really want to burn. So, you know, all these, you start doing yeah. this, this um, self-preservation math internally um, and I, you know, some of it isn't terrible. You know, you don't. I don't. I didn't really want to come in just, you know, like a bat out of hell, just like screw you and screw that and that's dumb. You know, like that's not. Why would you do that? Yeah. Well, uh, I, why would you do that? It doesn't seem part of your character. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I told you before. I sit back for a long time until I totally understand, and then I break out the bazooka. <laughs> 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 yeah, write an article on Quillette. Yeah. So, um, which, I mean, it's funny. I mean, I say that kind of humorously, but there, there, there may be an element of truth to that. I mean, I, I, I did speak up during the program but throughout the program there was a very clear us versus them so there was like a they, they often use the language of we we believe this we want this we have certain policy agendas that we want to accomplish we as pists and sexuality educators know that this this and this and this is what needs to happen in society and it's our job uh to take on an activistic role to shape policy and and all this kind of stuff um stuff that i I think is totally outside the realm of, well, therapy. Mm-hmm. Um, so one of the classes, you know, there was a moment where the professor was saying, you know, in this work, we have enemies who will oppose us. And it's important that we know the kind of arguments they're going to bring and the kind of attacks they're going to bring against us. And so we should be aware of that. We should ed- educate ourselves about that. So let's spend some time on that. And the way 
that that teacher facilitated that was by showing an episode of John Oliver, who is like a comedian. You know, he kind of he mocks people, <laughs> which I'm I'm not against John Oliver. It's funny, but it's not. It, you know, if you're trying to make a good faith attempt to understand the arguments of people who disagree with you, you know, playing a 20 minute video mocking people of a certain belief system doesn't really do the trick. So that was, it, so we, we watched that episode in class and then that unleashed, you know, sort of a follow up discussion, which was really just people in class angrily venting their contempt for anyone who's conservative or religious in any way uh, and was just, this about uh, homosexuality was this about well, no, this was about the, the specific context of that one class was we were talking about sex education okay. and so it's sort of this ongoing question of like what do you talk about in public schools how much do you teach you know and on the extremes it's you know well you should expose kids to absolutely everything at the earliest age possible which is kind of where this program pushed really hard you know <laughs> sooner earlier you know talk about you know what i am jazz and transgender stuff and and anal sex know, B and anal sex that. bdsm i mean all that stuff you got to normalize that stuff because there's some fifth grader who is who whose orientation is kinky and if he doesn't hear about that in school he's going to be marginalized and think that he's shameful and that's going to harm him so we better get that into the curriculum okay and then on the opposite end of the spectrum is, um, you know, religious conservatives who are afraid of sex and the only thing they want said in school is sex is bad and terrible and it'll ruin your life and, you know, give you disease. And, and that's how we came here. And, and the, yeah, but yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so it was just, it set up a, a very extreme straw man picture of, of what, you know, they believe um, and then, so let's spend an hour of our class time just sort of mocking and venting our rage at this viewpoint. So I, you know, essentially stood up and said, like, hey, as a person who, you know, my background, I come from a spiritual background, and spirituality has been a really important part of my life and my story, and so I find it really offensive that you think this constitutes a good faith attempt to understand people who disagree with you. Uh, that's not good education. Um, so that that was the probably the biggest open confrontation I had in a class. In this and program. how did you have to pay for that? So that was interesting. You know, it, it, it I I wouldn't say I had to pay for that directly. Um, the the teacher's response in that moment said, um, you know, I appreciate you saying that. I hadn't considered it from that perspective. <laughs> You uh, hadn't even considered it. <laughs> Why are you paying this? <laughs> that, so that's what it was like, sort of, okay, it was a congenial enough response, yeah, the, and I yeah. appreciated that. Um, did it result in any real change? No. And it, it is kind of shocking that they would say they hadn't considered that. Um, and this, that was an instance that led to something that was a regular feature of the program for me was when I would speak up in some way, I would have sort of afterwards in class, two or three people would come up to me and be like, hey, thank you. You know, I appreciate that you said that. I, I, yeah. I was thinking the same thing, but I didn't really feel like I could say that. Um, so there was a, a clearly an effective atmosphere at, at tamping down certain kinds of disagreement that okay. I found really troubling. There's an aspect of specifically queer theory, uh, and uh, queer theory, I think, is the most radical in the way in which it attacks normativity. Mm -hmm. And correct me if I'm wrong, sexuality studies and the stuff that you were uh, ingesting or being taught is kind of based loosely or very closely related to queer theory. And one of the things that they seem to attack is shame. They're trying to save yeah. people from being shamed or feeling shamed. They want people to feel okay. The flip side of that is that they end up attacking every form of normativity and promoting every form of deviancy. So there is a conversation to be had about what is normal, what is abnormal, what is a sexual orientation, and how do we... Um, 
how do we construct a society where sexuality is uh, health is balanced healthily between very extreme forms of behavior and forcing everybody who's not heterosexual and monogamous to be marginalized. So there, there is a, there is wiggle room about what is, what is normal sexuality? Why do we want to have a normal sexuality? What is the purpose of sexuality? And then what do we do with the people who have different sexualities or tend toward, uh, you know, outlying uh, kinds of sexuality? Yeah, you nailed it. And that, that's a really deep well. I mean, those are huge questions. Um, I will say, you know, in, in this particular program, they didn't, I don't recall the phrase queer theory itself being used, but the description of it that you gave is dead on. And really that goes back, as I understand it, to critical theory, which is, it, it defines itself as we are the posture that is always criticizing the norm. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, we, we critique traditional theories. So in that regard, it, it tends to really know what it's against, yes. but doesn't know what it's for. It wants to deconstruct everything. And it can't, it, it can't uh, adequately describe a norm in anything but negative terms. It, it is yeah. unable to actually uh, understand it sympathetically uh, because it sees it as an oppressive uh, yeah, power Yeah, it's always structure. oppression. Yeah. yeah. All suffering and inju- all, all suffering in the world is caused by oppression and injustice, as opposed to like. And that comes from order, uh, or any any form of order that isn't explicitly uh, critical in in its theory and its operation. Yeah, it ends up in some really weird places too, because I mean, like you were saying, is like you're trying to, uh, I guess, like norm the abnormal. You know, you know, pathologize and, and so, uh, normativity and uh, uh, normalize pa- pathology in in, yeah. in its extreme form. It does so that. like like this showed up in the program where like there was a real fixation on BDSM in the well, program. It, um, it seems that's the uh, the essence, the sexualization of conflict theory of an oppressor and the oppressed. It, isn't like, that it's weird? The, it's it's like concretization. a strange kind of like. Fetish. <laughs> like, 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 power is this huge fixation of critical theory. Power is bad. People are using their power to oppress, and and then here's this like manifestation of like, I mean, gosh, like, yeah, like a, a Freudian or Jungian analyst would would be would kind of have a field day with, like, but you're all about power. You're kind of obsessed with power and overturning power. And, to, you know, I don't want to straw man that either. Like, there's something to be said for, like, power is a factor of all of our relationships. And we're always sort of playing with power to a degree. You know, even in a dialogue like this, mm-hmm. you and I are kind of feeling out, okay, like, how active is he going to be? How active is, am I going to be? When do I yeah. sit back and listen versus when do I put myself out there? Um, that's just part of relationships. You can't avoid that. The thing mm-hmm. that I thought was striking was, like, particularly with BDSM, there tends to be a desire for, like, sort of to revel in the the darkness of it. Like, I'm enjoying, you know, if I'm, if I'm in that realm, there's sort of a tendency to, um, I want to be and do and say the shocking things and sort of show the darkness of it. But then if you treat me as dark or strange or odd, then I'm offended. And I thought, well, and I'm not saying that's true of all people who are into BDSM, but that is was sort of the ethos of the program I found. Um, yeah. Well, that, that's a tactic of uh, power to to disallow other people to judge you at all, to always be have the upper hand, even to cry bully, uh, to to play the victim. Yeah, uh, it's, yeah as long sure. as you're gaining power and overturning the system, then it's justified. Yeah, and it's it's but it's kind of a a judo kind of power. It's it's not overt power. It's a it's a manipulative like yeah. by 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 playing the victim, I will claim power. And again, that's very consistent with the theory as I understand it. Yeah. In in that context, or what did you take out of that? What did you what did you end up incorporating in this? Uh, <laughs> You know, slalom uh, course of uh, crazy sexuality, and and your article really gets into uh, some of the nitty gritty things. I'm sure that they uh, were pro pedophilia or hebophilia on some no. level, or was well, that where they draw the line? 
They draw uh, the line he, there. Well, hebophilia, what's that? Um, it's a technical term for uh, the uh, probably pubescent, prepubescent sexuality as oh, opposed to okay. actual okay. Uh, pre uh, child. Uh, no, they, it was interesting because they, they were so, it was all about normalizing everything. You know, all moral norms are bad. It's morally wrong to have moral judgments. That kind of thing was really thick throughout the program, which wow. I obviously yeah. wanted to be but like. But they're That's incredibly moral moralistic. <laughs> so moralistic. <laughs> so and, and it's weird because like they would say that within the realm of sexuality, but then they'd turn on a dime and start talking about social justice and how we have a moral obligation to do this and this and this and, you know. So it's like you actually got quite a, an, an, a a thick moral system that you're operating within, even as you say moral judgments are terrible. But then another place where they kind of turn on a dime is when it when they brought up pedophilia. It's like everyone kind of got awkward because it was very clear, like um, everything we've been saying doesn't really jive with this. So the de declaration was, well, it's all about consent. Consent is the one moral precept that we will accept, and we have determined that mm -hmm. anyone under the age of 18 cannot give consent. It's just, by definition, they are not 18? able to give consent. They just drew the line at 18. And what, what is that based on? Is that like some norm that they inherited from their society? Benjamin, that... Stop questioning it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, th there was no... Um, you, you couldn't unpack that. You couldn't. You couldn't ask about that, and which I think is just arbitrary and and silly. Uh, aside from the fact that, like, I just thought, gosh, at, at a university, hopefully there's some understanding of the complexity of of the study and thought about ethics throughout human history, and to think that you can just take all of that complexity and boil it down to consent. That's it. That's all we need to know. Shut up. Don't ask anymore. Don't talk about anymore. That's it. Um, it just struck me as so um, incomplete. Yeah. Well, to play to play the critical theorist on them, I'm sure they drew that line because they'd lose their funding otherwise. They, they're doing that to ensure that they are impregnable in a financial sense. I'm sure. I'm sure it comes down yeah, to if we if we I preach anything. Uh, that's illegal, then then we're compromising our own power in our station. Our I think stability. there's a lot of that. I mean, I my sense is the people in the program, you know, teachers and and participants, legitimately were not supporters of of pedophilia, but I don't think they had a really clearly thought out rationale. But they're it. but they they want to teach five year olds uh, about uh, master slave uh, relationships. It, that's a fair point. That's a fair point. I mean, they they. And they don't want to shame anybody, so they're fine with children consenting to one another? Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, that, that's true as well. So it, they didn't really get into the specifics of, like, yeah, okay, so if two kids are together, but, like, what if one of them has an 18th birthday, and how, where do we draw that line? I think they would sort of default to the law, is, mm -hmm. is what I generally heard. Um, but, yeah, it's not consistent. And I, I think the thought with wanting to expose kids to everything, there was... Very little appreciation for the fact that you could actually do harm to kids by exposing them to content too early or, or um, uh, mm. like no, no appreciation for the sensitivity that's involved with, with regard to sexuality. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so the, like if we just fire hose kids as early as possible, then they'll be informed They'll know everything they need to know, and then they'll be able to grow up maturely and make good decisions. And they will never have been shamed sexually, so theoretically they'll be free of sexual shame, which is foolish. I mean, I mean humans have sexual shame. That's, that's just, it's a complicated, scary, vulnerable part of what it means to be human. And to think that you can just say, oh, well, that's easy. We just, if we just turn off our moral reflex, then we'll have no shame. Uh, it just It's just a really simplistic way of approaching it. Well, not to bring up the Bible, but one of the foundational myths is dare. about sexual shame. Like, the, the yeah. first thing that happens in the story is that two people get along when they're not supposed to, and all of a sudden they're uh, ashamed about that. And you, you can interpret the, the Genesis myth in a variety of ways, but right. on but one that, level I mean, there's that shame. Of, that's part of the brilliance of that, is that 
you know, their initial um, failing, Adam, uh, the initial failing of Adam and Eve in that story was not in itself a sexual failing. But the response to it was that they covered up specifically their genitals, you know, that they became afraid and embarrassed about the part of them that was most vulnerable, most mm -hmm. sensitive, and most distinctive. Um, mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, you could, mm -hmm. you could take that from like a sort of a biblical literalist standpoint, but, but just to take it from a, from a symbolic standpoint, like, damn, there's some real insight about hu the human condition there, <laughs> and about what it's like to be a person. <laughs> um, but the, this, the critical theoretical view that sort of suggests all, all the problems that we experience as humans are the result of oppression. And so if you just get rid of the oppression, you get rid of the moralizing, you get rid of the shaming, then we'll all just be free and we won't have any problems. And we're going to um, moralize and shame until this is uh, take, <laughs> taken into effect. <laughs> yeah. Surely there will be no side effects to that sort of plan. Um, it, it was interesting because, like, somewhere, I can't remember if it was, you know, something a teacher said in the program or something they wrote, you know, one of the articles that I read from them, but... Um, it's this idea that, like, eliminating moralizing allows us to be curious and interested in the meaning behind certain acts. So, like, if you, if you um, destigmatize BDSM, then you can actually be interested in the meaning of it. And I just thought, why the hell is that? Like, everything everything has healthy components and unhealthy components, and we're okay. sort of operating in that inextricable complexity at all times yes you know like i mean so uh, a, a married couple having the most sort of quote-unquote vanilla sex that you could possibly have well if you could like open up their brains and see everything that's going on inside there's there's going to be some dark shit in there am mm. i allowed to say that <laughs> can i, can I can yeah I, totally I, I don't yeah. know if i don't know if i can swear just the, not in the first two minutes that's the that's the only problem. <laughs> okay um <laughs> You know, just that's that's unavoidable. Again, it's part of being human. So the, the the idea that we can only be curious or interested in or learn from things if we first completely destigmatize them, I just think that's that's foolish. It's it 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 seems to be a uh, corrupted form of scientific objectivity. Uh, I understand if you want to study a phenomena, you don't want to judge it during the study. Yeah. You, that doesn't mean you you take judgment out of that if that's a component of it. So it, it's just it's a failure to recognize that standing mm -hmm. apart from something and understanding it, uh, especially let's just say in a counseling uh, session, like you don't want to judge anybody. You want mm -hmm. them to be able to adequately discriminate uh, their own behavior and and understand it in in a framework where they can have uh, some sort of volitional engagement with whether something's good for them or bad for them. But your job yeah. is not to do that. You, you suspend judgment uh, to a certain degree, but when it's time to activate that uh, or to empower that, uh, yeah. because we need some sort of moral foundation in order to understand when certain choices lead to uh, poor outcomes like the, the whole shame mm -hmm. the whole consciousness conscience thing is to uh, allow us to live the best life possible in the right context and and uh, assisting somebody in building their own morality is different than you judging them so i understand yeah if that makes sense yeah yeah it's that like we we kind of have to ride the fence somehow where we can step into that objectivity but also re-enter the realm of, of, of subjective judgments and subjective doesn't mean wrong or stupid. It, it just means it's, it's a different posture that, that you bring when you're in that place. Um, and so you got to kind of be able to step into both realms a little bit and, and just acknowledge when you're doing so. And, and I think have some yeah. uh, humility about, about both of them. Hmm. I, I mean, it's interesting that you said that, that like, perhaps this posture that they're bringing towards morality comes from a sort of scientific, hyper-objective approach, because at the same time, the program was, th there was a lot of lip service in that program to science and being scientific. Um, That's a little surprising to me. I, I would have figured they attack uh, scientists and... Well, 
it was lip service. The colonialism. I mean, okay, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's... Man, it's complicated. Um, <laughs> I think I'm going to title that. That's, that's, that's the episode title. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, we're talking about sexuality, too. I mean, really everything, humanity, dang, we're, we're complicated. There, there was definitely lip service in certain aspects. So, like, um, when it comes to talking about sexuality education, they would sort of talk a lot about... Um, you know, X number of states require sexuality education to happen in public schools, but only this much smaller number of states requires that education to be scientifically and medically accurate. Hmm. Um, and so then the whole room is supposed to gasp in horror that like, oh my God, they don't even require it to be scientifically accurate. And it's like, yeah. well, yeah, like, so those states didn't, you know, explicitly write in their okay. legislation yeah. But, like, that doesn't mean that they're, like, saying, hey, everybody, please have scientifically inaccurate sexuality education. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, but on the heels of that, they, you know, they'd have, they really got into this with, with the issue of gender, you know, because yeah, science gonna... is out the window when you're talking about that. You know, suddenly, you know, gender identity has this purely subjective uh, uh, definition, and boy and girl is not a scientific category male and female are not scientific categories um but even that they go back and forth you know because you know we'd have some classes in this program that were more focused on biology or medical stuff you know so they put the the slide up on the screen that says you know like male anatomy and it's like <laughs> hello <laughs> male well, uh, male assigned ad ad anatomy or yeah. male identified <laughs> anatomy <laughs> Yeah. Well, and it was funny too because I wanted to like, like in some classes where they would try to remove that language, I, I, I would kind of think, can I raise my hand and say, hey, do we have a term for people who are born with a vagina? Yeah. Uh, could, Menstruators. Uh, if, if only there were a scientific term <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that existed in the world. Um, so they, they go back and forth, and then there, you know, there was. I, you know, I would ask questions at different times to try to get clarity about some of the beliefs that were being put forth in this program. And one of them was when they when we're talking about um, where does sexual orientation and gender identity come from, and and are these things fixed at birth? Are they inborn and innate and unchangeable, or are they malleable? Are they impacted by your story and your experiences and your culture? And, you know, they kind of play both sides of the fence, depending on what the, I guess, the politically correct right answer was in a given moment. So I just asked the question directly at one point, and the professor said, um, his answer was really shocking to me. I was so dumbstruck that I didn't even know what to say. But he said um, uh, that activists have really doubled down historically on the idea that all of these things are fixed at birth and unchangeable because that allowed us to get some policy goals accomplished. But now that we've made so much progress in terms of policy, yeah. we're, we're able to back off of that a little bit and admit that, no, these things are kind of fluid and many people experience them as fluid. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Did, so, you just, so you just said, we as activists... I mean, he didn't say we, but like yeah. this program that clearly aligns itself with progressives and with activists, you know, we as activists distort the science in order to accomplish certain policy, policy objectives. And once those objectives are met, we're able to speak differently about the science. Yeah. And that was as far as that conversation went. We never yeah. really got deeper into it. Yeah. It yeah. It's uh, in the framework of uh, seeking power. And people talk about this as though it's postmodernism, or they call it postmodernism, but it, it goes back to the sophists and Socrates. Socrates mm. is more aimed towards truth and understanding or knowing, and the sophists say everything is power. It doesn't matter what the truth is, because uh, everything is, uh, is power. And it's very activists, Nietzschean. Uh, well, yeah, and Nietzsche kind of <laughs> brings that up again in a way. And, it, it really felt that way, where like it's. Um, there, there is nothing except the will to power. Everything is just power and oppression. And since that's true, um, the best thing we can do is use the enemy, to, the enemy's tools 
in the service of social justice. Yes. Um, I, we will use power to manipulate and control. We will violate law or ethics or science in order to accomplish our policy objectives. And really, I mean, the thing that specifically about the program that was most troubling to me, I mean, it, it was really, it really killed a lot of my respect for my own profession because I saw how deep this stuff has worked its way into it. But even more troubling than that to me was how thoroughly this has worked its way into public education of children. Because, you know, only a few people are therapists and, and a, minor, you know, a small number of people relatively go to therapists, but most people go through public education. And, and if you're actively seeking to indoctrinate them as little kids and turn them into activists from kindergarten, gosh, that's really scary to me. And um, I mean, that's motivated me to um, get involved even in my local school district level, just to find out like what's what's happening there. And and I mean, I didn't have to dig deep at all before I saw, yep, it's there. It's mm -hmm. there. It's people who say, you know, like will say flat out, um, you know, you're never going to please all the parents in the district. So it's my so I prefer just to think about what's best for the kids which to me just feels like coded language for I get to decide what I think is best for the kids. I don't have to honor their parents. It's not my role in the school district to um, provide education that will serve the families in our district. It's my role to give those kids the information that I think they need, even if their parents want to deny them that information. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's and if you if you look into what that information is, uh, it's revolutionary in its uh, core and in its outcome. Uh, it very yeah. explicitly wants to disrupt and dismantle. If you look at the language, if you follow that rabbit hole, yeah, absolutely. Uh, DEI. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that that's all in diversity, equity, and inclusion, and. Um, you know whether so whether it's all that abstract stuff like the bigger picture ideas like DEI, um, or it's the very specific stuff like I am Jazz. Which are you familiar with? That Jazz uh, Jennings is a yeah publicized uh, transgender uh, male to female uh, person. Yeah, and the book basically for kids teaches you know it's sort of I it's sort of Jazz telling her story, saying um, you know essentially. I was born a boy, but I like music and dancing, and that means I have a girl brain and a boy body, which mm. is not only horribly stereotypical and like mm. foolish, <laughs> but also completely unscientific. Like the idea, you know, if you, I don't, I don't want my children being taught in elementary school that they might have a girl brain and a boy's body, mm -hmm. not because I'm transphobic. But no, because, because it's very expensive to uh, provide them with that particular pony if you go all the <laughs> way down, <laughs> if you take it to its conclusion. <laughs> Maybe you could, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, this yeah. is a fiscal, this, is, this isn't a moral issue with you, it's a fiscal issue. Yeah, it's purely financial. That's, <laughs> <laughs> just, you, if, if you, as long as you're willing to fund my daughter's transition, you can go ahead and indoctrinate her however you want. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding about that. No, um, so this is this is something I had a. I won't get into my own personal stuff right now. But I had a very strong dream this morning that kind of laid out my path, uh, rather explicitly. But it doesn't matter. But one of the parts of th things that I, I need to figure out how to do is to show how this stuff scales. And one of the ways in which we do that is by examining the language, examining how it causes people to believe or uh, what they believe and how they behave, and then how it operates on levels scaling from the individual all the way up into a nation and all the different uh, iterations. And I think that uh, what I loosely think of as social justice, uh, intersectional, postmodern, blah, 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 uh, it, it you can look at it operating in all these different 
volunteers. Uh, and yeah. you as a counselor interact with the individual and you foster relationships and you, you uh, counsel them through their personal choices, their, their relationship to their past and to their future and to their present. So my question is, um, how does what you have been exposed to specifically in the sexuality uh, program that you took, but also this kind of loosely termed critical theory uh, stuff, why do you think that that, or how do you think that that impacts the individual's uh, psychological health? Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, spitballing here. Um, I think it creates a lot of guilt and anxiety, a tremendous amount of guilt and anxiety. I mean, because there's a sense where, I mean, okay, like take the situation we're all in now with the pandemic. Like, I feel like for the last year, Anytime I talk to somebody and they say, uh, you know, oh, I'm doing pretty well, it's followed up by like, I feel bad for doing well because everybody's having such a hard time right now. Or if they okay. say, I'm doing poorly, I'm really stressed out, I'm struggling, they might say, well, I feel bad because I know so many people have it so much worse than me. There's this constant need to um, put yourself down and, and bring yourself down to the level of suffering of all of all the others around you and to feel guilt for any amount of goodness that you have. Um, so can you spitball uh, yeah, yeah. how compassion is properly managed and how it's improperly managed? It's okay to have a little bit of guilt about the poor, right? As a, it, um, growing up Christian, you know, you, you want to feel... Uh, feel their pain, I guess, but you don't want to feel bad for them. Yeah, I, I, mean, How I think, do you I think compassion that? versus guilt. Um, I think gratitude is really a proper category there. You know, okay. to say, like, I've got something good. I'm really grateful. And I still care about other people who don't have that good thing. I'm not just going to ignore them or, or, or um, shut it out of, my, out of my brain. But I'm grateful. I, I think it really disallows gratitude. The, okay. this, this this thinking disallows gratitude. Um, so are you I mean, uh, feeling particularly grateful for being a white male uh, today? <laughs> um, I mean, sure. <laughs> I mean, I, I, in, in some ways. I mean, I, 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 it's weird because I don't want to... Um, a lot of this language has become so tainted. So, like, to talk mm. about privilege or, or white privilege or white supremacy or all this stuff, like, these are you know, in themselves, they can be coherent concepts that I can talk about and go, yeah, like, uh, there is definitely privileges and good things that I have that I don't deserve, many of them that I did not earn. Um, uh, and, my gosh, that's amazing. And I know the chances of me having those things if I wasn't white. Um, are, in this country, yeah. Yeah, yeah, significantly less. So it's like, okay, yeah, we can talk about that. Um, and, but, so this, and this is part of the work is to, uh, the work is to distinguish between the coherence and the benefit of these concepts and, and of themselves, but how they are deployed to produce bad behavior, to produce uh, uh, yeah. not bad behavior, even just uh, bad feelings, and and just uh, to bring people mm -hmm. down, to, to kind of yes. corrupt the 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 human uh, nervous system and their the, our c compassion and our empathy. Yeah, it becomes kind of it, it's about bringing things down. So critical theory is about deconstructing, and it's it's about um, it can become about hatred for success and hatred for. Um, uh, those who are doing well rather than genuinely about compassionate compassion for the poor you know it's like hmm. let's 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 build a guillotine outside of Jeff Bezos's house rather than let's see how we can actually help people who who you know uh, it's not that we want everyone in the world to live in the poor neighborhood it's like ideally we'd have all neighborhoods be more beautiful that would be <laughs> nice huh mm -hmm. um, but it but it tends to be focused on the againstness, you know, I'm against goodness. I'm against people who have stuff. I'm against money. Rather I'm against than, the norm. Uh, I'm against yeah. morality. Yeah. Hypothetically, if you were dealing with somebody who has a lot of anxiety or not dealing with, but 
mm-hmm. counseling somebody who has a lot of anxiety, has a lot of guilt, in, uh, and, and you kind of let them talk and you watch them unravel that or unfurl that or unpack that. And it comes mm-hmm. down to these uh, social justice beliefs uh, that they hold really strongly, too. How would you go about counseling them towards putting those ideas and these concepts mm-hmm. in a better uh, order that relieves their yeah. anxiety, that frees them from that guilt and, and that going around moralizing, sermonizing, uh, like being very uh, hyper uh, moralistic, but at the same time, very against morality because it, it causes all the shame that they're <laughs> experiencing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean that that's a that's a hard question, especially when yeah. it's one thing to work it's with somebody who's dealing with anxiety, it's another to deal with somebody who is really really um absorbed in this yeah. ideology. Um yeah. obviously you can't like attack it head on. Um but I think I mean I think you, there can be one-on-one room for a conversation about like you know, can you be grateful for that? Part of, like, one principle of healthy functioning, in my mind, is you can be in close proximity with another person and say, this is me, this is you, and I can be close to you and still be different from you and be okay with that. So, when people are able to tolerate that well, I can say, well, yeah, I mean, I think what you just said is wrong, um, but, you know, we can talk about that and you're allowed to disagree with me. But I'm always also, it's it's part of my role to feel out how much they can tolerate that. There are some clients who will either just be overwhelmed and offended by that and they won't be able to carry on the conversation or they come to therapy looking for someone who will give them answers so they don't have to take responsibility for their life. And if I volunteer my opinion too strongly, they'll kind of be like, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you become, uh, uh, your your counselor role becomes a shepherding role, becomes a leadership role, which is not yeah. something that you necessarily want to do or didn't sign yeah. up for. Yeah, that's what, I mean, that's one of those things I have, like I said, an allergic reaction to. Particularly, like, given my experience of having been in a college church where, you know, 18 to 22 year olds are quite young. And then you've got the staff and pastors of the church who are able to just sort of give them these packaged answers. And that can be really toxic. So as I became older in that church and I saw some of these dynamics more clearly, I was very glad to be in a position of a therapist where I could um, say to people really clearly, hey, that's not my role. Like, I don't want to be responsible for what your belief system is. You've got to sort that out. Okay. Yeah. Why you bring up the negative word toxic of, uh, uh, there's a technical term that's not coming to mind, but mm. taking a set of answers or a set of predefined terms and instilling it into somebody else uh, mm-hmm. through a religious context, through a teaching context. Why do you not like that? Uh, Why do you Um, resist that? Or what do you see as problematic about that? Yeah, well, there's this, I'm not sure what the term you were looking for is, but one term that comes to my mind, aside from indoctrination, is um, introjection. Hmm. Uh, Yeah, so so this is from um, Fritz Perls. He's the founder of Gestalt Therapy back in the 70s. Is this where you take the turkey and the the injector and you just kind of (laughs) like put all the juices into it before the cook? (laughs) You can do it that way. (laughs) I mean, his, his language was that an introject is like an undigested belief or idea that you just took on from somebody else. So like uh, a great example of this would be um, uh, a a kid who is about to cross the street and sort of whispers to himself in his mother's voice, don't cross the street. You know, he hasn't fully integrated that idea into himself. He has an inner picture of his mother telling him, I'm not supposed to cross the street, but it's not fully digested, not fully integrated. And that's, that's a, that's not bad, but it's, it's immature. 
you know, a more mature functioning adult is able to say, okay, I remember this is what I learned. I can sort of understand the complexities of it. And I know why I'm deciding to cross the street or not cross the street at a given time because I've, I've digested this. So the, the image is of like an, an undigested piece of food just sitting there in your stomach that you haven't really integrated into your body yet. Hmm. So I, if I indoctrinate people or if I just tell them what to do, um, they might do the right thing, but they're kind of functioning in this sort of automatonish way. They're sort of living out what I told them, but they're not, they're not doing it as a fully functioning human. They're just going, it's, it's rote. Um, this is, I, I think you, you, you're highlighting something that is probably one of the underpinnings of why I am a free speech advocate or I am very against language codes because it infantilizes the population by saying that this is stuff that you just can't say. So or people they, never digest that or they, they're never allowed to understand why. It, it's taking the agency away from the individual. It's treating everybody like a child. And then it allows the government to very slowly insert itself as some sort of authority figure over people that, that I am the father and you are my children kind of relationship. And I, you know, being an American, probably other uh, personality defects of mine, I'm very resistant to that. But it, it's partly because it, it doesn't allow me to have responsibility and to really understand why I don't want to say those mm -hmm, things. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the identity politics component really plays into that because um, it, the, with what you just said, the goal is to really think things through and process them and digest them so that you can understand them in a firsthand way. But if we're talking about identity politics, well, I have to believe from the outset that I better not try to process the experience of that other person because I fundamentally am inherently unable to understand it. If I, as a white person, try to understand what a black person is going through, uh, uh, um, I'm not sure what the word is, but that's 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 wrong. That's bad because I can't. It's appropriation. Understand. It's colonization. Yeah. There's a bunch yeah. of different terms for that. But so I, I think it actually disallows genuine empathy because real empathy is about deeply putting yourselves in the shoes of other people. But the, the core belief here is you can't do that. So don't you can do it with gender, though. Um, if if you're non-binary, I mean, but I, but I think a lot of people like you're not allowed to judge the experience of a trans person who claims to be, you know, something other than their birth sex because you don't understand what they're going through. So mm -hmm. just take take it on authority that they are what they say they are. And you're not allowed to dissect that at all. You're not allowed to, to assess it um, or really even think deep about it. You just have to accept that mm -hmm. what they're saying is true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that that uh, attitude is in a multiple. Uh, it's it's in multiple different areas, and it's called uh, standpoint epistemology. That's the technical mm. term where you can only, okay. and and it has some caveats. The uh, let's just say the black person understands the white person, but the white person can't understand the black person uh, because the uh, the slave, let's say, and and I'm not calling black people slaves, but this is where the thoughts come from. The slave understands the master because it's uh, the slave serves the master. But the master yeah. doesn't understand the servant because the servant is taking all this responsibility that the master is offloading to them. There's this, mm -hmm. there's these weird kind of functional caveats in that. But it does ultimately it does break down empathy. It breaks down firsthand yeah. experience. It breaks down the competency or the uh, yeah. the learning of how to interact with people who do have a different experience because you're you're just not allowed. And then you have to accept on authority. Uh, all these other claims that any given person makes. Yeah. yeah, and I would challenge that right out the gate. Like even the idea that, I mean, there, there might be an argument to be made that, say, the slave has better understanding of the master than the master does of the slave. There might be something there, but that can be taken to a really, um, I think, foolish place or shallow place. Where, like, I, I saw this some during the Me Too movement, which as a therapist working with sexual mm. abuse for so many years, like at first I was like, oh wow, this is really cool. This is like a, a revolutionary shift in our culture's awareness of sexual harm and how pervasive it really is. And then just saw it, you know, get taken to some extremes, you know, to like the kind of believe all women and, and even, you know, got into, you know, 
I'm remembering one specific social media argument where the this person was claiming that the victim and the victim alone knows what really happened. And so their story always is 100% true and anyone who contradicts it in any way is wrong. And it's like, sorry, that's just false. Like, first of all, you don't know what was really happening in your perpetrator. You don't know what that was really about. There's just no way you could. But second of all, like the victim can be, can have a distorted understanding of their own experience. That's a really hard truth to say, but but that is reality. Yeah. Because we can all be dis- distorted in our understanding. Here, this is a really fascinating thing that I thought about a lot in the program is we've got this hyper-polarized world. And, and really at the beginning of this conversation, I was talking about how it's important to think about things on a spectrum and understand that there are extremes, but but usually the reality is some complex interplay between extremes. And that's really true in our world politically right now. You know, there's the right and the left and they're super extreme and, and the right tends to fall along the lines of stereotypically masculine postures or approaches or beliefs and the left falls along stereotypically feminine postures and approaches and beliefs and and then that plays out in terms of um <clears throat> these ideologies that i saw in the sexuality program so i just i found it so fascinating that on the one hand this ideology and this program was all about sort of eliminating the meanings of sex and sexuality. So masculinity and femininity, it's all purely a social construct. It's meaningless. Let's not even pay attention to that. It's just pure subjectivity and you get to be whatever you want to say you are. But all the while, the whole thing was embodying this polarized tension between masculine and feminine. And they're just living out one side of it, saying the feminine side of the spectrum is all good. They're not using those words, but that's what they're embodying. And the masculine side is all bad. And my whole hope is, gosh, don't, aren't we obligated to wrestle deeply with each of these things and find out what it looks like to have a healthy, real dialogue between them that integrates them and, and what we need is a marriage, and and uh, not not making this like a, an anti LGBT thing. You, but you can word, uh, use the word uh, integration uh, if you want to avoid marriage. <laughs> <laughs> but I, it's interesting because I don't want to avoid it. You know, like I, hmm. it really is to some degree. We we need to rediscover the capacity to have a harmonious marriage between different things to some degree, and specifically a heterosexual marriage, not in the sense of disallowing gay marriage in a literal sense but in the sense that hetero meaning different you know so like we need to figure out how can different things function together in a productive uh yeah 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 Yeah. so i i I, I was struck by the irony of how much that was being embodied accidentally by this program that also is trying to destroy the very idea of of binaries yeah yeah (laughs) Was there uh, uh, patriarchy rhetoric or the patriarchy's the bad guy kind of thing? Yeah, yeah, it was in there. They um, yeah. that that wasn't the primary thing, um, but they they did get into there. I was actually surprised by, you know, there were times where they talked about the patriarchy and they talked about um, you know problematic things that men do and whatnot. Toxic masculinity. Yes, toxic masculinity. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But there was also a, a little bit. I'm thinking of one class in particular where they actually talked about, okay, and what are ways that we can look compassionately through the eyes of men? Um, so the, the anti-male rhetoric, the, the overt anti-male rhetoric of the program was actually not that bad. Mm. Um, I didn't agree with everything they did and said, but there was, they at least carried it with a little bit of complexity. Hmm. It's funny because the, the program, I mean, it clearly had a set of values that they were pushing really hard and fine you know like that's going to happen everybody's nobody can really be values free you can't be completely impartial and objective i get that so my hope isn't it's not like i'm mad that they have a philosophy as a program or a value system but i wish that they would acknowledge the complexity and acknowledge hey this is our perspective and there are others so let's talk about those others in a And as in so far as we can manage it in an impartial way to look at the strengths and weaknesses 
uh, you know, acknowledging some of that complexity and making room for open dialogue, you know, I'm not expecting the University of Michigan to suddenly be, um, you know, not hyper liberal because that's what they've always been since I was 18 and went there as a freshman. And <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But but some room for uh, some wiggle room for that other perspective, and and that's uh, particularly. Uh, I don't want to go into this too much in this conversation, but particularly with the uh, Capitol siege or whatever happened on uh, January 6th, that whatever happened uh, is is beside the point for me. It's how people are are telling that story in such very tight terms that they are not allowing that there is it's one it's an incredibly complex event so nobody really understands if we're going to take it's going to take a lot of time to unravel it but the rush to concretize that and then all the power players behind that and then all the individuals that are getting swept up into it was bad it wasn't bad it was this it wasn't that and trying to go through with my own opinion and my own resistance to defining it but still trying to get to a place where just introduce into the conversation around it just some wiggle room if we could mm -hmm. just give some wiggle room then we don't have to go to total war we don't have to have yeah, a divorce yeah. if there is a place where we can have dialogue yeah and, and trying to trying to you know and and as a centrist so-called you get you get crap from both sides because people are, both sides yeah. think that the other side's out to kill them uh and and they both use that rhetoric while they while they bemoan the polarization that they're experiencing they're, they're completely <laughs> demonizing the other side that's, so it's just it's yeah. such a hard difficult thing to introduce a point of pride for me in my own you know social media interaction which is not a lot but um is that uh I get, I, I find I, I tend to get criticized and praised by people on both sides. And, you know, yeah. one conversation, this person will be like, you're crazy, stop it. And then, <laughs> you know, and then the other side, they'll be like, thank you, Tim, thank you. And so I'm like, okay, I'm doing something right because I'm <laughs> pissing off people and pleasing people on both sides in, yeah. in various measures. So, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's a mark of a. Uh something that I've seen in my work and something that I see in Sasha and something that I, I, I see in you, even though this is our uh, first meeting is this ability to appear just slightly on the other side of an issue, just slightly to the other side of center from the person that's watching you just to, to appear or to have the ability to be, uh, to just move around depending on where you are. So you have a hetero or a hetero uh, yeah. dox, uh, relationship to whoever you are just to, it's funny because it's, them. It's um, it's a little critical theoretical, you know, yeah, like because yeah, yeah. I because when, when I'm postmodern too, right? I mean, seriously. <laughs> so I, I, I've got my own internalized <laughs> critical theory, but it, like I, because because I don't fully know what's real or what I, what's true about the universe, and so when I'm talking to somebody, I tend to see, well, that, that, I don't, I'm not quite that. And so then that can lead to being a little bit of a contrarian. And mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a problem because, like, uh, the, the Martin Luther King quote comes back to me again and again where he talks about um, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. So what I would add to that is, like, it's easy to know what you're against. It's easy to be against things. It's easy to blow shit up. It's easy to tear things down. It's really hard to build stuff that then will be subject to critique. It's easy to say that building is not perfect. Okay, fine, build a better building. I, and so I wish I knew more what I could really stand on firmly. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's just ongoingly troubling to me since some of my own certainty in terms of faith and faith systems started to disintegrate. Um, I mean, I, I feel the lack of grounding, you know, on a regular basis that like, gosh, what is real about the universe? I wish I knew. I, I would, you know, there was a time in my life where it felt like God was much more accessible. And mm -hmm. um, I was listening to one of your interviews with um, the woman who... Carrie Smith. Is, the, I can't remember her name, but she used to be in comedy and is not as well. Yeah, as Carrie Smith. Be. Yeah. Yeah. Where, you know, and she's talking about having shifted into Christianity and having experiences of hearing God's voice. And I'm like, jealous. 
<laughs> and like, I, man, yeah, I, I had some experiences like that, and and those experiences have ceased to be really accessible to me, for who, you know who knows what reasons. Um, hmm. Probably, uh, just it's probably it's, just the Trump that, era. Once he's out, um, dude, that would be 2016 oh, to 2020. Man, uh, <laughs> dark night of the soul. I've heard stories cloud of unknowing saying, "Yeah, when this president took office, I saw a dark cloud descend over the White House, and maybe that's what it is." And like when he's gone, like the the next day, gotta be like, "Tim, I can speak to you again." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh shit! Oh, we, we totally pissed oh, off half my audience. There, there, there my was some sarcasm in all of that. Congratulations for reaching the end of the discussion. If you enjoyed it, do be sure to leave a review or a comment or a thumbs up or whatever you need to do to show that glorious algorithm that this is some good stuff. And do be sure to go and check that back catalog as it is brimming full of fantastic conversations. Links to provide monetary support are down there in the description as well. Have a good night.